Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Running a backhoe might not be what you associate a wildlife biologist with, but it's an essential part of the work here at the Blue River Public Fishing and Hunting Area. The Blue River is certainly one of the most popular and unique tracts of land that the Wildlife Department owns and manages. It's estimated that in any given year, more than 100,000 visitors are attracted here to camp, fish, and hunt. And the area managers are constantly at work to improve the access and experience for everyone. Some of the best public lands in the nation. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. Right there at the end, it started to come off a little bit. Okay, stuff together on that last shot, and that's the only reason you missed. It. It's coming off as you as you were shooting. So the Connor State College Shotgun Team started. Uh, they built this location in 2013, and then in 2018, I became uh, the third coach for the team. Yeah, way to pick it up. So I am an alumni of Connors. I was on the livestock judging team when I came in 2006. And then I did a couple of things afterwards. I went to OSU and got my bachelor's and master's. And then I went into production agriculture and worked at a big feedlot for JBS under Five Rivers Cattle Feeding. And then I was an ag teacher. And then this job came open and I was like, well, I had a shotgun team in Alva. And I was like, that's a dream job right there to teach ag in college, come back to my roots where it was Connors. I loved Connors. Um, it was really hard to leave my kids in Alva. I loved being an ag teacher, but this was also a really good move. And my family, I have some family here, so it was really good to get to move closer to them as well. Well, I was a part of the Canadian County 4-H shotgun team. I started when I was about 11, really started getting into it when I was 12. I started with an 870 pump. Um, and then I got to move on to an over and under SKB and that's actually being shot right now by one of the students. Um, still have it and <clears throat> I really, really enjoyed it. I was on the third place state team my senior year. Uh, and so that was really, really an amazing experience. And then I got to take that experience to Alva and start a high school team there. <clears throat> and then now I'm here and get to just do it full time. <laughs> Ah. Way to get that second one. <laughs> I can't hear. I can't hear the deal go off with both of these. Oh, so well. I'm like hesitating. It is a little bit different being a woman with a, a mostly male team. The most I've ever had on the on the female side of things is four, and it's usually a very small percentage. That's not even one percent of the team. Um, so. Sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. You'll see that in their performance. So if they don't start to change things and do things um, as, they're, as they're being coached, you'll see them not be on the traveling team, which is the top 10. So uh, you see that quite a bit. My favorite part of being a coach is getting to actually be out here on this beautiful range. There's 1,300 acres here that uh, the college owns, and this is our little private heaven right here. Um, and getting to work with, with students, uh, teenagers and young adults like they are, uh, is just really awesome because you get to take them from that from that awkward teenage, I just graduated high school stage and make them into young adults that are gonna be respectful and successful citizens. And this is a really great sport to really mold them and shape them. And I also use my sophomores, um, peer peer evaluation. And um, that's really, really helped in the past. When we first start, I use, I use them. You can see it right now happening. I have my sophomores out there scoring and telling the, the freshmen um, what they need to change, where they saw their shots. And, and that's really, really helped um, using sophomores as well. Don't worry about that, miss. 
disciples. I had a young man who was, he was not a shy or he, he was a very well liked person in the community. He's from a, a local area and um, he came in just a duck hunter, never shot competitively. This was a whole new world to him. He came in and he shot, you know, sevens and twelves on skeet and trap, not very good. And he ended up being one of my top five shooters by his sophomore year. And he was um, really good at shooting long shots. And he was a phenomenal international skeet shooter for only getting to do it for a little bit. So that was a super good success story. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it low house? We got any doubles, right? Uh, doubles. It's doubles. Yes. <laughs> Are they ready to go again? Yeah. Yeah, we got to make it happen. Yeah. Round two? Round two. It's so inspiring to get to see these kids. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say I'm a, a, a phenomenal shooter. I don't get to shoot very often because I'm always out here watching them. So getting to see them really just grow and develop, just it just grows my heart and makes me feel so good about what we're putting into the world today. Um, they're just, they're amazing kids and they just turn out and, and it's so good to see them be so successful. Win in my book. <laughs> <laughs> It was right there, man. Last shot. You let it get to you. Let it get to I you. I couldn't do nothing. Well, Jimmy, don't wait so wait long to shoot it. those. Wait behind it. Yeah, don't wait so long. How I recruit is um, I try to show up to some of the state and district events if I can. Usually they're during like class periods and practice periods. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but that's why I host a youth contest. There's not a lot. Um, there's not as much of the skeet realm in Oklahoma when it comes to competitiveness in like the 4-H and FFA side of things. So I host that contest and all those kids get to come out from anywhere in the state. I've even had people out of state come and shoot at that contest and they, I get to recruit off of that. And then obviously I use the, the students I have now. If they know someone from their hometown, they're like, hey, this kid's gonna be able to help you out next year when I leave. I use that as well, so I, I have an abundance of, of being able to bring them here, watch them shoot, and have coaches from other teams tell me about them, and then my students. So I have a good I have a good pool to pull from. Way to pick it up. So a lot of people think that shotgun sports ends at high school, and that's not the case. You can come to college, get a scholarship for it, and shoot for another two to four years, depending on uh, where you go from there. We have that availability here at Connor State College. We're a two-year program, we're very successful, and you're able to shoot and get an education at the same time right here on our private facility. Hi guys, this is Gary from h &L Processing, Colgate, Oklahoma. I own a local processing plant here, h &L Processing. We've been in business about seven or eight years. Coming up is opening weekend of rifle, and it's one of our busiest times of the year. The Oklahoma Wildlife Department puts on a program called the Hunters Against Hunger. You bring a deer to us, we process it, and we put it to a local food bank. We have a little bit of simple paperwork to fill out. Once it's filled out, we'll take care of the rest. It's a program that our communities need. There's a lot of people around here that could use this meat. Each deer that's brought in, say just a mature doe, will probably net 25 pounds of meat or 28 pounds of meat. And that's a lot of meat going to our local community. I remember when I was a kid and growing up that I really enjoyed the camaraderie and, and, and going and seeing all the big deer that was checked in at the old check-in stations. Your local processors are mainly the same thing. We have all the deer, all the people here. We have a good time, we throw contests, we do anything we can to have a good time and promote this. I challenge the other processors, as well as hunters, to get out there and get all the donated meat you can.
name's Ashley Melis, and I am the North Central Region Fisheries Supervisor for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. And today we are on the banks of Skytook Lake at our Skytook Lake Nursery Pond. And we are gonna try to take a look at what we've grown in the pond this season since we started this process in February. This pond is a cooperative effort that's been going on since 2013 and the cooperators are the local lake association, the Corps of Engineers, and the Zinc Ranch which the pond is on their property. We have to fill it early in the year so that we're not pumping young fish that um, have spawned into the pond because we want a pond that's clean with nothing else in it. And then we fertilize the pond and then later in the year we go collect Redfin Shad broodstock. Over the course of the summer, we come out to just about every week and we check water quality to make sure that the environment is good for the fish. And then we do some seining and collect fish to see how they're reproducing and then how the fish that have hatched in the pond are growing. Thirty-five. Redfin shad are a very important forage source in Skyatook Lake. Um, the only problem with threadfin shad is that they um, are subjective to winter kills, which means if the water gets too cold for too long of a period of time over the winter, threadfin shad tend to die. So what we're trying to do with this effort is make sure that there is at least some broodstock in the pond to repopulate from year to year. Lots of 26. Are you going to secure? Yes. Is it good? Yeah. Yeah, we eat there quite a bit. Why fish? Like why fisheries? Why wildlife conservation? Like that's really, <laughs> that's a dumb story because I opened the OSU course catalog one day and said what looks like fun, I want to have fun for the rest of my life. <laughs> Seems silly though, because there's so many people that are like, oh, I've known I wanted to do this since I was 16, you know, and it was really more of a, a happy accident for me. I mean, I get to work outside. I get to, I get to be, I get to be outdoors. It's, I get to do something different. Those Thirty-five. Well, they, they, de they decompose and they Thirty-seven. Like natural fertilizer. With a job that has such seasonal activities, every time you get a little bit tired of doing something, it's time to change gears and do something else. So work always is exciting. I was born and raised on a farm and kind of around welding and so forth and and I just I got interested several years ago in making knives and I didn't really start making them until oh about five or six years ago. I tried it a time or two and just you know once in a while but I never did get serious about making them until about five or six years ago. I taught myself more or less. I uh, kind of a trial and error thing. I'd 
temper up a blade and then get on the anvil with it and hammer it. And if it break, well then it, I knew I was wrong. And I just kept working with it until I got it where it wouldn't break. And I'd get it hard enough that it wouldn't break. And then if you get it too hard, it'll break. So whenever I build one, I don't want it to break. Whenever a guy buys one, I don't want it to break on him. So I generally test them on an anvil with a hammer to see if they'll break. It, most knives you find today are made out of stainless steel, which is uh, is good, you know, but uh, I kind of old-fashioned the, the knives, the early knives, were made out of carbon steel, and, and so uh, I started making knives out of carbon steel, and I make stainless once in a while, but I just got interested in using the old carbon steel that comes in saw blades like come out of sawmills and and then uh, out of files and hoof rasp and so forth. The knives, some of the knives I've been making, you uh, with like uh, out of a hoof rasp, you have to take the rasp itself and and uh, take the temper out of it because when you pick it up like it is, it's so hard you can't work with it. So you got to draw the temper out of it. You you heat it and put it in lime and draw the temper and then. You work on the knife, you build the knife, cut it down, and and it's called stock removal, and uh, you get it built and get it down close to being finished, well then you put the temper back in it, which you gotta heat it up and quench it in oil, and, uh, and uh, get the temper, and then draw it. You get it a little too hard when you first quench it, but then you gotta draw it back where it won't break, and, and that's kind of the process I go through. I generally draw my own patterns, and uh, I just get an idea of the pattern, and I'll draw one till I get it right, and then maybe I'll make up the knife out of wood, and if it feels right, then I'll go ahead and make the knife, and uh, generally they get along pretty good with them, have pretty good luck with them. It's a lot of grinding and uh, polishing and shaping, but uh, I generally always design my own knife, you know, or somebody gives me an idea uh, how they want a knife, well, I generally figure out a way to build one that'll suit him. I don't try to copy anybody, I don't, uh, but I guess my knives are uh, a little different than, than most knives because they're, most of them made out of carbon steel and a little bit old fashioned way of making a knife and most of your new knife makers make them out of stainless steel of some kind, which I don't have any objection to it. I just uh, kind of hard headed, I guess I make them my own way, you know. If I make, I make it to be used. Uh, a lot of times the guy won't use it, he'll put it up or, or display it or something, but I make it to be used. I made it, I, I make the knife to be uh, used in case you ever need it, well you've got one that you can use and, and, uh, and, uh, and I guarantee that if something goes wrong with it, I'll do my best to fix it. I make a, a lot of different styles, I kind of tend to stick to one or two or three styles, but uh, if I get an idea or somebody's got an idea how they want a knife made, well, if it isn't too radical, well, I'll try to make it for them, but if it's too radical, well, I don't generally get, try to get out too far. I try to make a functional knife that he'll, that he can use and, and get some good out of. The 
people that buy my knives, I, I make a knife or two and and uh, see a friend or two and first thing you know I sell a knife and he takes it and shows it to different friends and uh, and pretty soon I get a call from one of them wanting a knife and it's just kind of spread from there. I, uh, the knife sells itself. I don't sell it, it sells itself. I've got a teepee and sometimes I camp in it and go hunting and deer hunting and so forth and camp in this teepee and I've got a big buffalo robe that I use to sleep on and a friend of mine that camps with me, he calls me man who sleeps on buffalo robe and teepee and uh, every time he sees me he just calls me man who for short. And, and, uh, so I started using it on my knives as a kind of a trade on my knives. Couldn't put all that on there, that man who sleeps in teepee on the buffalo robe, pretty hard to get on there, so. But it's kind of an Indian name that I acquired over the years. I don't know what'll happen on the man who knives. They, uh, I just try to make a good knife and hope whoever buys one or acquires one some way will, uh, that it'll do him a good job and uh, and hope he'll, I hope it's made well enough that he can pass it on to his son or his grandson. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect state to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Wow. <laughs> cool. All the smoke or dust coming up off Yeah, there. that was cool sounding. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma. <laughs>